everybody, welcome once again. I'm Imran Garta and you're in the stream. Today, the ethics of volunteerism. Who does the volunteer abroad industry really serve? On the orange couch is our digital producer, Malika Bilal. She's here looking out for all your live feedback as always. So tweet her your comments and questions using the hashtag AJ Stream. Hi, Malika. Hey, thanks, Imran. Also here is Ken Budd, a writer who's volunteered around the world. He's just written a memoir called The Voluntourist. Ken, glad to have you in thanks. the stream. Looking Good forward to all your thoughts as we uh, discuss this issue. Now, remember, you can stay in touch with the stream on a number of social media sites. Follow us on our Facebook page where you can leave your comments for this show and others. Just go to facebook.com forward slash AJ Stream. Hi, my name is Milena Mikhail Debas and I'm in the stream. Now a chance to see the world while helping others. That's what some people are looking for in volunteerism. Experiences that combine travel and volunteer work. It's a fast growing industry that's attracting business from mainly well-intentioned people interested in giving back. But who does the industry really serve? And what impacts are volunteer tourists having in local communities? Now, a new documentary on Al Jazeera's People in Power explores volunteerism's effect in Cambodia, particularly in the country's orphanages. Let's take a look at a taste of this fascinating film. Cambodia's orphans rely on the kindness of strangers, the dedication and donations of international volunteers. But when charity becomes commercialized and goodwill is used for profit, how do you guarantee the most vulnerable aren't exploited? Good question. How do you guarantee that? So is the volunteerism industry exploiting misfortune for profits? And what ways can volunteer work abroad be done ethically? Well, here to help us answer all of those questions is Al Jazeera reporter Juliana Rufus, who went undercover in Cambodia to investigate so-called orphanage tourism. She's joining us via Skype from Turkey. And in New York is Tom Pastorius. He's vice president of Projects Abroad, a UK-based business that provides volunteer placements around the world. Projects Abroad was one of the organizations featured in that People in Power documentary. Tom and Juliana, welcome to you both. Juliana, if I could start with you, there were numerous red flags raised in that documentary. It's, it's an excellent documentary, and I watched it this morning. Uh, take us through some of the major ones, particularly as they relate to Projects Abroad. I mean, firstly, what I would like to start with is that we are looking actually at volunteering and we're looking at volunteering in orphanages specifically. Uh, so we're dealing with very vulnerable children there. And um, we're looking at various things. The increase, firstly, the increase of orphanages in Cambodia uh, and the fact that actually the number of orphans in Cambodia is going down and that about 85% of children in Cambodia's orphanages actually have parents. So it's a system, the volunteering system has become increasingly commercialized. What we're saying in the documentary, that it is important that volunteers are properly supported when they go into volunteering positions, that they need to be supervised if they, if at all, they actually work in orphanages and that the volunteers need to be vetted. They need to have criminal background checks um, and it needs to be made sure that the children are protected. Okay. And these are the red flags that mm -hmm. we are raising. Tom Pastorius, have you watched the film? I did, yes, I watched it. Have any today. concerns? Uh, I, I do have some concerns. I, I think uh, they, they got some uh, facts that weren't quite correct, but the the main concern that I have was the implication that because Projects Abroad is a company, that uh, we were somehow forcing children into poverty, and we were somehow fooling uh, our volunteers who are well intentioned and very motivated to help with the situation. And I I don't think that's a fair characterization of the. Uh, for profit. J Juliana, were, were you industry. trying to imply that? That's what Tom's saying. No, what we're saying is that uh, Projects Abroad is a company that is charging volunteers up to $3,000 a month for volunteering in Cambodian orphanages. And this is excluding the flight and that Cambodian orphanages uh, get, and this is what Projects Abroad tell us, $50 a month per volunteer uh, who's volunteering in an orphanage. Uh, and you know, we, we thought um, Projects Abroad themselves tell us they're a commercial volunteering company. Um, and uh, what we're saying is there's a lot of academic research that supports that 
uh, orphanages are not the best place for children, especially not if they have uh, parents, which the vast majority of Cambodian children in orphanages have. And the Cambodian government that we have interviewed as part of our film supports children being cared for in communities. And if the parents aren't alive by relatives or by other people in communities, and that commercial volunteering is fueling a system where orphanages are being opened uh, instead of having children mm. cared for by their parents or in communities. Okay, so Juliana, before we expand uh, this discussion, I want to show a little clip from the documentary where um, you go undercover as a volunteer and you ask one orphanage director named Sinith uh, if you can actually take the children out. I want to play this for the community. We want to test how serious he is about protecting his orphans by asking him if we can remove some of the children. For everyone's safety, we've asked a social worker to join us. We tell Sinet she's a friend and interpreter. We wanted to, um, to this afternoon to see if we can take some of the kids to have a little tour um, in, near Phnom Penh. Uh, how, how many kids do you want to do that? We just thought we'd take maybe, you know, three, three four. Three, four. Mm. Uh, which one that? We're thinking three okay, nights night. <laughs> maybe you can. Yeah. Uh, I can follow. Sinet is actually getting us to choose between the children. And minutes later, we leave with four of them. Never once have we been asked for identification. So, Tom, we just had a look at that particular clip. Now, obviously, those children were opened up to innumerable possibilities there. Juliana and, and the team could well have been predators preying on the kids. They could have been very untrustworthy people. It was very easy for them to take them out. Um, I suppose many of the viewers are asking, is this a typical scenario? Could this happen so easily in many places in Cambodia and elsewhere? I think it, it could. And uh, I, I think it really shows how um, some credible looking foreigners in Cambodia can fairly easily infiltrate uh, a relatively trusting grassroots organization. And I think that's why it's important when you do a volunteerism trip that you go with a program instead of uh, you know, do-it-yourself volunteering, which is the way they presented themselves in, uh, in the documentary as someone that just knocked on the front door, essentially, instead of through an organization. No, I, I don't think that completely answers the question. I mean, that, that's irrelevant, isn't it, the way they actually went about it? The point being that there doesn't seem to be the checks and balances in place to prevent this from happening if somebody wants to do this. Well, b bottom line, the, the orphanage director showed a, a very bad uh, judgment in, in that scenario. I absolutely agree with that. And I think that's something that needs to be improved upon. I don't think that's really relevant to the volunteerism industry in particular, if the question is related to uh, how we find our volunteers and how we vet our volunteers, um, we do perform background checks that was, that on volunteers that are over 30, and that was said in the documentary as well. And any volunteer under that uh, must provide a reference before they come with us. In addition, our staff, our local staff, who are local people who speak the local language and grew up there and understand the situation, check in regularly on the volunteer and at the placement to make sure that all is going well. And that's for the benefit of the placement as well as for the volunteer. Okay, in intrigued to know why uh, it's a background check for people only over 30, but we'll perhaps revisit that in the post show for now I want to go to Malika exactly and Ken I want to bring you in here because there's a there's a lot of thoughts from our community online um, on this topic Shireen tweets volunteer tourism reinforces dependency on Western powers and individuals um, but while you think about that Afruz follows that up saying volunteerism volunteerism excuse me means so many things when it involves short-term work with vulnerable children let's ask who really benefits mm -hmm. so in your opinion you you've, you've volunteered all over the world right. um, who benefits from this well, ideally, the community or the wherever you're working should be the, the main beneficiary. But I think in a perfect world, everyone benefits. And I should say, too, I didn't just work with children. I worked in the environment in, in Ecuador, you know, in a climate change project and, and Katrina homes afterwards. So, but definitely with children, there's a definite level of, 
concern there. And before I went to a children's home, I, when I got there, I asked, I said, you know, I'm concerned, does this create a cycle of abandonment? And I've seen studies that have said it can do that. In our situation, we found they have a very stable environment there. Most of what we did was, you know, we helped fold clothes. We would do whatever work they needed. And I found for these women, they were happy to have that help. And like I said, as I said earlier, there was a cultural interaction going on that wouldn't have happened if we had just shown up as tourists. Well, I wonder then, how do you reconcile? You said that you did have uh, the concern that you might create um, this feeling of abandonment in the children. How did you reconcile that? Well, in part, what they told me there, which was they have these mothers, as they call them, who take care of the children. They were fairly used to volunteers coming in and out. There was a stable environment there. So it wasn't like I was with one child all the time and grew very close to him and then moved on. Um, most of the kids were at school during the day. We, when we were there in the mornings working, it was typically the infants. Um, and as far as dependency, one of the organizations I worked with, Cross Cultural Solutions, does not allow volunteers to give money to the communities because they feel that creates dependency. And it should be just purely about the work and about the interactions. Mm -hmm. Juliana, looking at, uh, at your film again, the fact that you only, and I think we need to make it clear, you only went undercover with, with one particular orphanage. There were others that you visited that gave you access and, and you sort of looked at the standard be best practice. But even within that, I wonder, I mean, we saw you very nicely playing with some of the kids, teaching English uh, to some of the kids. Uh, you're a very good filmmaker and a very good journalist, perhaps. I mean, you're, you're not an English teacher. I'm not an English teacher. Many people <laughs> out there aren't. Um, besides perhaps being a bit of a nanny for these kids for a few hours every day and playing with them in the courtyard, do you feel that you could tangibly give them any proper skills and any benefit besides just being there in a nanny capacity? Um, I think that really depends on the orphanage. We saw one orphanage school, which we show in the beginning of the film, which was extremely well organized. They hired uh, qualified volunteers who had a working with children background, and they were working in a team with local teachers in the classroom. So that's something that seemed to work great. Uh, what we're criticizing is young, untrained volunteers being sent into an orphanage where they work unsupervised. Uh, and I'd quite like to backtrack because we're focusing on yes. this particular orphanage that is called Kuko. What we did, we went to an NGO that investigates uh, cases uh, of neglect and abuse. Uh, and they told us of a failing orphanage that had failed uh, two and by now three government inspections. And that's where we went undercover. Uh, it so happened that this was an orphanage uh, where some volunteers had voiced criticism, which is how the whole investigation started. Some of the previous volunteers who'd raised criticisms were from projects abroad, others were not. We then went into this orphanage and we were left alone with the children, unsupervised. We were in quite a few situations where there was no English speaking staff. Now, what happened is that out to our great surprise, and this was all unplanned, we then on one of the days, our account, um, then one of the days encountered a new volunteer from projects abroad, and, and that's what you see in the film. Uh, and we were surprised that a 21-year-old youth without any training or schooling ended up in the same environment that we had come to investigate, an orphanage that had failed minimum standard. There was an absence of English language staff that could guide this young volunteer. And as you can see in the film, we could actually take out some of the children. So clearly the safety of the children was not safeguarded. Okay, before I bring uh, Malika back in here, Tom, you want to respond to any of that? Sure, it's true. We, we did receive some feedback uh, about that particular orphanage and we looked into it. Um, what's not said in the documentary is that we also got some very positive feedback about that placement and in the end we couldn't find any evidence of uh, mistreatment or uh, embezzlement and we decided that it's better to continue uh, sending volunteers there because there is a very clear need for additional help at that site so it, it is true we got negative feedback but we got positive feedback as well Malika. Well, I, I want to read a tweet here uh, that brings up a point you raised a little bit earlier, Imran, um, from Ali, who says uh, she volunteered in Arusha, Tanzania. She delivered babies and taught a M Muslim religion class. Not sure why I was qualified besides being a privileged white girl. Um, but I'd like to turn to you because I want to broaden this out um, a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a video question that I'll play here. Uh, have a listen. 
I'm Cameron from New Zealand. Uh, while I was in Kenya, it was great to see volunteer dollars going into community development projects run by passionate young locals. These uh, projects included computer training, microfinance, and even meals for local street children. If it wasn't for the money from volunteers, the local community would not be able to fund what this community group was doing. And it upskilled so many people in the area. So does this help or hurt local communities? Well, from my own opinion, and I think I was influenced because my trip to Costa Rica, my second trip, was Cross-Cultural Solutions. And as I mentioned, they feel strongly that you should not be giving money, that it should be about the volunteer experience and the interactions and the assistance. So typically anywhere I went, I was not giving cash, I was not handing out things. And, I, and when I was in Bethlehem, I noticed a woman came and she was trying to give toys to the kids. And of course, she got swarmed and then there was, you know, half the group didn't get it and you could see there was a sense of rejection. So I, I never really got into that. I mean, whatever money I'm getting from the book, I'm giving back to the places where I went in the organizations. But you know, I think it can get a little dicey when you start handing out cash. Um, Ken, so. Ken t tell me about the vetting process that might have taken place and how it varied from place to place. Was it rigid or stringent at all anywhere? It varied from organization to organization. When I went to Kenya, I submitted to a background check. I submitted references. Uh, most organizations wanted you to provide, fill out a questionnaire showing your skills, you know, and how they could place you to match those skills. So everyone had their different criteria. And, and a place that is particularly on the radar of sex tourists or sex pests, particularly pedophiles, uh, Cambodia, mm -hmm. um, we heard from, from Tom saying that they only do a background check on, on somebody who's over 30. Do you think that that is enough? Um, it, it seems to me you would want to broaden it just because, you know, anyone is potentially a threat. Um, and, you know, this is one thing to, add, be to ask in these organizations. You know, when I went to China, there were very strict rules. I worked in a school. Volunteers could not be left alone with a the child. There were, there were rules in place like that. And they had some of what Tom said, that there were regular interactions between the staff there. But it was very clear. We had a very clear orientation of the do's and don'ts our first day. Uh, Tom, let's, let's revisit this, this age 30 thing. Why particularly 30? I mean, theoretically, there could be a 28-year-old pedophile out there who could get a letter of recommendation from a friend or a school. Sure, well, the, the number was actually suggested to us by our partners in Cambodia. Um, in other countries, uh, depending on the local laws, uh, a background check is required for all volunteers who are working with small children. And of course, we follow those local laws. Juliana, is that good enough? Well, I, I put, obviously, I don't think it is. And th there is a big campaign in Cambodia, actually, that is called uh, Children Are Not Tourist Attractions. There are various NGOs, international and local. You've got UNICEF, you've got Save the Children, you've got Friends International, a local NGO called Project Sky. They are all campaigning and saying children are not tourist attractions and you should not have um, unsupervised, unskilled volunteers working with children in orphanages. And I think, I mean, if somebody's a, you know, is a child abuser, it, it, you can be a child abuser with 21. In fact, one of the big problems in the orphanages is um, we're talking a lot about the abuse that comes in potentially from the outside world. The orphanage that we see, saw and went into, one was run by a businesswoman, another one was run by a former actress, and the one that we investigated, Kuko, uh, was run by somebody who was a former policeman and a bodyguard. These are not people who've got a background in child protection or social work or as a psychologist. So, so my question would be, um, who, who is there in Cambodia, who is an expert who works with projects abroad, who can make sure that the children are safe and uh, protected on all levels from yep. internal abuse, child on child abuse, um, and, and of course abuse from outsiders. Okay, that's a good question. Let's pose it to Tom. Tom, who are the experts that you're working with in Cambodia? Our local staff are former employees of NGOs in the area and generally have been doing related work for their entire careers. And mo most importantly, they speak the local language and understand the local culture. So I, I don't agree that our volunteers are unsupervised. They are supervised. They're guided by our staff as well as by the local placement supervisor. Um, how often does your local staff visit the orphanages? Uh, generally, it would be on a weekly basis, unless we had some reason to check on them for, for some other reason. If all goes well, about a weekly basis. OK, Juliana, are you satisfied with that? 
Not really, because the volunteer that we met in Kuku was there, unsupervised. And I'm, if I say unsupervised, I'm just saying that there was no projects abroad staff. The, the local orphanage did not have staff. I mean, no, no staff. They had the director who was questionable. Um, and, and there were no social workers. And there were no translators for the young volunteers. So when we encountered him, uh, he could actually not communicate with the children. Tom? Well, in terms of communication, I think it's very important to remember when you're working with small children, you, you don't need to speak the same language. There's plenty of things that you can do to boast their ego, to give them individual attention. Um, and secondly, when, when you're considering uh, the staff in, in the placement, of course there weren't enough staff to run uh, without our volunteers. As I said, we only place volunteers where there is a genuine need, where there is a job to do. Okay, let's get some more community in. Malika? Uh, there's a video comment here that I'd like to play. Um, can Have a listen. Hello, I'm Melando from Germany. Having been a volunteer in Kenya for a year myself, I never experienced bad influence from volunteerists, but neither have I seen people changing anything, really, since it's only a short-term engagement. What I do think is that it gives a platform for intercultural exchange, which can make its way into different societies and can fight the likes of prejudices and especially racism. Will this have a long-term effect? And, and then can you speak to his second uh, part of his question, which is about the intercultural exchange? Right. Well, as far as a volunteer making a long-term impact, I mean, when you're there two weeks, there's only so much you can do. And I always tried to view it as, you know, whatever little tiny thing we can do to help, we're going to do that. And clearly, the longer you stay and the more involved you are, the better you can do. The intercultural impact, I think, is huge. And I mentioned being in Palestine. I mean, that, and there's a ripple effect from that, because you come home and you start telling people, these are the people I met and this is what I experienced. And you're, you're in at a deeper level than you would be. And you know, my Facebook page, I go on now, it's like the United Nations. I've got people from Kenya, I've got people from China, Palestinians. And then there's your fellow volunteers. I met people from other parts of the world that way. So, But it does sound as if the benefit is primarily for you and not them, no? Well, I disagree. I mean, I think it was both ways. I mean, the Palestinians had as many misconceptions about Americans as mm -hmm. I had about Palestinians, and that changes. And it begins a dialogue that continues. You know, I say I was there in 2009. I continually hear from these people, and it, it just it keeps going. Is that what, what this is mainly about, Tom, dialogue? I think the cross-cultural aspects of the experience are very, very important. Uh, when I reflect on my experience on a volunteerism trip, I realized that as a matter of course, I received much more than I was able to give the people that were my hosts. Okay, interesting point. Malika, you want to give us a couple more tweets? Before yes, we go? Uh, before that happens, actually, I want just to point out that on our website, of course, uh, yes. there is an orphanage volunteering do's and don'ts, uh, best practices, things to look out for um, when one does decide mm -hmm. to do this. Um, but I'd like to go to a tweet here. Um, and Tom, I'm going to direct this to you. This is from Christina Taylor. And she says, I think volunteerism is a sustainable business model. It's not a sustainable long-term development model. Now, I think this is especially uh, important in terms of your organization, which is not a nonprofit organization. Uh, it's a business. That's right. It, it's a business. And our business is taking volunteers who are relatively young, relatively inexperienced, and placing them in safe, productive functions in uh, developing countries all around the world. And that's what we do every single day. OK. And when we get into the post show, I'm going to pose the question, since it is a business, does enough of that money actually get to those who need it most? We're going to look at the figures that Juliana brought up at the beginning of the show, delve into them a little bit and ask whether 50 bucks out of 3,000 and some of those other equations are enough. So stay with us. The post show is at stream.aljazeera.com where we continue to talk volunteerism. Don't go away.
I'll go back to the post show on stream.aljazeera.com. I'm just uh, scrolling through some of the tweets that have come through using the hashtag AJStream. The last one coming through from Alexandra Locke asking, I, or saying, I don't think the question is whether the volunteers are being supervised properly. The question is, should they be there at all? I don't think that's a question. I don't think we need anybody to answer it uh, for the moment. But fascinating uh, point for us to chew on. Let's get into the figures. Let's give Juliana a chance again to mention the issue of money. Um, it costs a lot of money to go to places like Cambodia and elsewhere as a volunteerist. From the research that you've done, not much of that money actually trickles down to the kids that you're supposedly helping. Yeah, I mean, it's actually quite interesting. We, we see on the one hand that the volunteering organizations who, who make a profit and, and who say they're for-profit organizations. So not much money is coming from many of the large international volunteering organizations into the orphanages. However, what you do find is that a lot of the volunteers actually get very, very attached to the children and they keep sending donations. So even if the large international volunteering organizations don't pay much money to the local orphanages, there are enormous amounts of money being sent uh, via donations or money being brought um, with the volunteers. And we show that in the other orphanage in Lighthouse, where we find some Canadian volunteers who said they've sent several thousand dollars ahead of themselves. Um, so the local orphanages uh, are you know, some of them are getting a lot of money too. And and the point that the film is actually making is because it, it can be, and I'm not talking about all orphanages here, but clearly a, a fairly large number of orphanages because we, we made this film in response to local uh, reports that, that are published by the government and by international organizations. Orphanages are opening because there is a demand for placement. They're not opening because uh, the orphans have a need for a home. Ken, and, and that's yeah. a dangerous point. trend we're highlighting. Excellent point, Juliana. Ken, the fact that it's lucrative, extremely lucrative for many, does that sour the entire industry? Well, I don't think you can blast the entire industry. I mean, it'd be like saying we should abandon democracy because there are crooked politicians. I mean, I, I work primarily for nonprofits, and I know the ones I work for are not getting rich from this. Um, so, you know, I, I think without question, there are problems. And I, think, I don't think anyone's, and I'm glad we're having this dialogue mm -hmm. about it, but, and, and it, a lot of this falls on the, on the traveler to ask the questions, you know, am I, what am I doing here that's, that's truly helpful, and, and what is the organization about, and how are they spending the money? Tom? Well, I, I think it just goes to show when, when you're giving money away in, in countries like that, you need to be very careful about how you do it, and it is pretty standard practice, and in this industry, uh, not to give a lot of money to the placements, uh, as Ken said, uh, with some other organizations as well. And, and the reason for that is we don't want orphanages that are created for financial gain. Uh, they're created because it's really the, the last option for these children. Milana, I want to jump. Uh, um, excuse me. Um, I want to jump in here with a tweet from Milana uh, for Juliana. I'll pose this to you. Um, she says, "As an African, I'm tired of the inexperience traveling across the world to give back. Feels more like playing hero." Uh, but on the back of that, ponder this one also. There's a tweet from Dynamic Africa who says, "Volunteerism also alleviates governments of their responsibility to provide for local communities." Did Did you see that? And would you agree with that sentiment? Well, I mean, that, that's going into policy. I, I think th this is, again, let's go, go back to what I think could be good practice, which is the orphanage school that I highlighted earlier on, where international volunteers were working with local teachers. So if there is a model where there is a skill share from people with the experience to working with local counterparts, where the local counterparts can, can learn and then become role models and teachers themselves, I, I think that's probably a really good model. So maybe, you know, we've come up with a lot of criticism in this discussion, that's a point I'd like to put forward as something that worked, in our opinion, in the, and you can see it in the film. Okay, I want to go to Tom now and pose a tweet from Alice Nicole uh, asking for clarification. She asks, so there is no overseeing body that regulates the for-profit companies? She wants to know, she wants to be absolutely certain, and it seems as if she's not very happy that there is no overseeing body. You want to address that? There, there are two standards organizations for this sort of field. One is in the UK. It's called the Year Out Group. 
primarily working with gap year students. We were a founding member of that. And in the U.S., there's an organization called the IVPA, International Volunteer Programs Association. We're also a member of that. It's a consortium of 10 to 20 programs in either case that get together and set best practice. Okay. Uh, Ken, I want to ask you uh, to address what Milena brought up earlier on, what uh, Malika uh, read to Juliana from Milena's tweet regarding uh, as an African, you know, she doesn't feel very happy, people wanting to play hero and, and go on these trips. Do you feel that in some cases there is a patronizing, almost imperialistic air about a lot of people, the way they want to go out, perhaps they have good intentions, uh, yeah. the way they want to help the locals in poor countries? Yeah, I think it certainly can happen. And, and, you know, I certainly never felt like a hero. I certainly, I usually felt it way in over my head, but I, I think people do come in and they don't understand the cultural differences mm -hmm. sometimes and they come to a place and they start giving out orders and, you know, that's just not how it works. And if, if you don't understand how things work, I mean, just time alone. I was told in Kenya, you know, one o'clock means one thirty. So if you come in demanding punctuality, you've already set a bad tone. So I'm sure it happens. Yeah. Okay, I want some final comments from both Juliana and Tom. Juliana, have a go. Um, well, well, I would say that I don't obviously uh, oppose volunteering per se, but I think really in, in the case of volunteering in orphanages, if it is at all endorsed, and, and for me that is a very, very big question, uh, I think that should only happen if a volunteer can work in the context of a well-trained local counterpart. Okay, Juliana, great pleasure having you on the program, Thank and you. we will no doubt promote that film. It's available on our website on the People in Power uh, segment of uh, aljazeera.com. It's available online on YouTube and of course running on Al Jazeera English for the duration of May. Fantastic film. I urge people to watch it. Thank you for joining us, Juliana Rufus via Skype from Turkey. Uh, Tom, final word? Uh, I, I really agree with Juliana that uh, the, the best model is when you can take an eager uh, volunteer from Europe or the US or other parts of the world and place them with a, a well-trained local person. That is the model that we strive for. Uh, every day we also have to balance the concerns of uh, placements where perhaps they don't have the resources to provide that and we have to make the decision whether we should continue to support them. Tom Pastorius, the Vice President of Projects Abroad. Great pleasure having you on the program. Thank you very much for addressing a lot of these concerns and uh, for giving us the time of day. We really appreciate it. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. And Ken, of course, any final statements you want to make? Well, you know, we, we focus mainly on orphanages, but you really can make a difference in some of these things. I did an environmental project. The researchers could run more research studies with, with volunteer labor. So it really falls on the traveler, though. You really have to ask a lot of questions and do your homework. Okay. Ken Budd, the author of The Voluntourist. Looking forward to reading it. Maybe you can get, you. get me a signed copy. I think we can swing that. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot for joining us uh, on the stream. Great pleasure. Thank you, all of you, for uh, joining us for this conversation. Uh, now, before we go, we like to mix things up a little bit here, give you some variety, give you a taste of some of the stories that we're following, and check out some of the stories that you're following. Perhaps these will... Uh, grow into full-blown shows. Here's Malika with some of the story leads. We start with rising tensions between Israeli citizens and African migrants seeking asylum. It's a topic that we first covered earlier this month, and we continue to get updates on the situation from the online community. The latest concerns incidents on Wednesday night in South Tel Aviv. Here's a video reportedly showing protesters attacking a car with migrants inside. Let's take a look. <laughs> Hundreds of people joined this anti-migrant rally in which some parliament members reportedly referred to migrants as cancerous infiltrators. The protest soon turned into a mob attack that some journalists got caught up in. Hage Matar, a reporter for 972 magazine, was one of those who says he was attacked. He told the stream what happened. Uh, instead of the demonstration being focused on government policies, government representatives were inciting the masses against the refugees and against leftist activists. Um, and that led to a mob forming, attacking um, activists and journalists like myself and others, and later also turning on many asylum seekers um, attacking stores, cars, people on the street, looting. Uh, it was a horrific 
event that lasted for about three, four hours of, of mass violence, um, one which I think is not the last we're going to see of its sort. Well, we'll continue to follow this story, and we want to hear from people on the ground. So tweet your videos and pictures using the hashtag AJStream. Imran? Thank you, Malika, and thank you once again to everybody for joining us for this discussion on volunteerism. Hope you watch Juliana's film. It really is pretty good. Now, uh, just a reminder, on Monday's episode of The Stream, we ask, has the global financial industry cleaned up its act? Many of you don't think so, I know. We'll ask the tough questions. New York banks have already set aside $20 billion for bonuses this year. Send us your comments, your outraged comments, your questions, whatever you want to send us on that using the hashtag AJStream or on Facebook.com forward slash AJStream. See you next week.